Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. This episode is sponsored by ASTOTS Academy, which offers online courses that help investors, aspiring professionals, business leaders, and even beginners to improve the finances of their lives and their businesses. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your discount on the course that excites you the most. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, and I'm here with featured guests, Mr. Dr. Robert Ramos. Robert, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. <laughs> now, I'm going to introduce you to the audience. So listen up, folks. Dr. Robert Ramos completed his undergraduate degree from Ateneo de Manila University. He finished one master's degree in business management from the Asian Institute of Management and a second master's degree in business economics from the University of Asia and the Pacific. And to top that off, he completed his doctoral degree from De La Salle University. Robert has more than 20 years of banking and finance experience working for both Philippine and foreign institutions. He has experience in the fields of trust and asset management, product development, treasury funding, fund management, marketing, and relationship management. <clears throat> and with all that experience, you may be saying, well, geez, Andrew, does he really have a worst investment ever? <laughs> We're going to get to that. He is currently first senior vice president and group head for RCBC Trust and Investment Group. And Robert is a CFA charter holder, a CAIA charter holder, a CIPM certificate, and the current president of the CFA Society of the Philippines. Robert, take a moment and fill any further tidbits about your life. Well, it's interesting. This is a good part of my life right now. There's a typhoon in the Philippines and there are floodwaters rising all around us. Uh, so far, so good. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people here in my village are quite worried, but uh, we're hoping that things uh, abate. So that, this is an interesting point of time in my life and I'm glad that I'm here during this time. <laughs> well, we appreciate taking the time to share, even though you're facing some real challenges. I know the feeling living in Thailand, we definitely have had our share of floods. And just the other day, we were driving home and we couldn't tell whether our car was floating or driving. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling, I know the feeling. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Oh, okay. This is a good one. This is about 2013, 2014. Uh, I was just recently promoted as group head um, of a bank asset management firm. So I, I was head of uh, investments for a while and also head of business development for a while. So this was a relatively new role for me. But I think I was able to do the job and there was some confidence in me um, that I felt. You know, I've passed audits, business has been growing. and our funds have been actually doing well. So I think that was a good thing. But we prided ourselves in being able to select undervalued, quote unquote, undervalued investments. And I think that's where the story starts. Um, so we choose firms that have a good story, choose firms that have a big upside. And for the past seven years, it has worked very well, immensely well, to the point that a lot of the funds that we manage were in the upper tier. So, of course, being in a senior post, I was not involved in the day-to-day -day management anymore. I was more involved in the strategic level. And as I was taught by my predecessors, you know, it's all about valuation, valuation, valuation. It's all about for value. So the story goes, I find this stock, you know, one of my best analysts brings it to me. My best fund manager brings it to me also. And he says, this is a very nice investment. Uh, it's in the power industry. Um, it's quite undervalued, you know, below double digit uh, PEs. Um, the growth potential is fantastic. And you're in the Philippines. Consumption is increasing. Uh, definitely consumption for power is increasing as well. So you think back, you push back your chair and look at the numbers. Wow. This firm has the best of the best. Not only do they have great numbers, you know, and great potential. Management is no joke. These guys have a fantastic track record. Um, they're brilliant. And I know I know them. Well, let me correct that. I know some of them personally. 
So I thought highly of this firm, very highly. So here I go saying, okay, let's, let's, let's take a piece of the pie. And maybe, you know what, considering we've done this before, we have a, in the Philippines, we have a 15% maximum limit for a fund. You know, you can't invest more than 15% for a particular security. So that in itself serves as uh, a way that we can balance as our chances. We're getting too much into a particular stuff. So, okay, I say, okay, 15%, that's, good. that's fine. It's worked for us so many times before. It's kept us safe. So maybe if we should go in, maybe we should up the ante, you know, because everything looks good. And up until now, everything that we've done worked, okay? It may not have, some of it worked over what we expected. Some of what we've done in the past um, may not have performed up to par, but it still performed well. Okay, and remember, this was post global financial crisis, so everything was on the up and up. So that being said, and a lot of the stocks have been performing very well. A couple of my team were talking; they were saying, "You know what? The usual ten percent may be too small for this particular stock." You know how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the numbers, and people are saying, "Okay, maybe we can go twelve." Maybe we can go 13, and everybody said, okay, 13, 14%. Um, we can probably go that much. And, and we same, can just trim down that position as it just rides up. Yes, exactly the mindset. Exactly the mindset. As long as it's never 15%. You know, as it reaches 15, we sell. We, we, and that's how we were thinking. We were saying, as it hits 15, we cut it, we cut it, we cut it, we cut it. And then, uh, but we're probably going to keep a core position considering the valuations. That's, that's the mindset. So we buy it, wait a couple of days, all good. Uh, things haven't been ramping up uh, as much which was expected. You know, a value play, we're considering uh, stocks to probably work their way up in the next you know, three, four, five, six months or a year or so. So that being said, maybe three, four, five months, everything's not moving as much. And on the sixth month, the stock starts dipping dipping initially not so much that it would cause a panic but enough for me to take notice and of course since you went you invested already we're saying okay the numbers will actually save it the numbers will actually be able to um save the stock once people see the value and once we are able to unlock value people will start buying so that happens on the seventh, on the eighth month, start the stock starts dipping more and more. More and more that I start to notice. Uh, people managing the funds are starting to notice. Now the ninth month, clients are starting to call because this, the, the fund that was doing so well for them suddenly it's not doing so well anymore. And if you look at it, if you analyze what's, what's bringing the fund down, because everything was kind of doing okay. It was that particular stock bringing the fund down. So the uh, months rolled into a year and we realized that this was not helping. This stock that we thought that would outperform is suddenly becoming, you know, not the star that we thought, but the dog that we see it was. So slowly, painfully, we had to sell that position. Slowly, painfully, we had to unload. Um, and of course, the fund took a big hit. The mm -hmm. fund that was performing so well for the past four or five years, you know, at the upper tier suddenly was a middling player or even below the 50th percentile. It, it did not only impact us from that, from that sense because, you know, you had to talk to a lot of clients. These clients were so used to you performing so well that they took it for granted that, that outside the global financial crisis, you would probably make five to 8% easily. And now you were probably making one or two percent, and sometimes on bad months you were losing three percent. So that was the worst investment ever uh, for me. I had to sell it quickly, and not only that, had to manage a lot of client complaints. What's the lesson? Mm, yes, tell us. What's the lesson? The numbers are good. Management is good. All these. Uh, Sometimes, my friends, the numbers will lie to you because you enter into this uh, 
way of thinking that this is a stock that will actually provide value. But sometimes you forget, you forget the aspects such as how liquid is this stock? How do people, uh, how, how many people cover this stock? How many analysts cover this stock? How many people look at this stock on a daily basis? We thought it would be the reverse. Once we started investing in it, there would be some more interest. And it was true to a certain extent, but it did not entice uh, the local investing public uh, to buy into it. Maybe, maybe um, if this was not a public fund that was valued on a daily basis, if it was not the fund that had nav tools on the website uh, that indicated the, the price per share daily and how it moved up and down. Maybe it, if it was valued maybe every three months or every year, it would have been a good investment. But considering that it was a daily investment, it was a daily nav tool valuation. Yes, it's something that we should have thought uh, much more of. Mm. So that's, and, that's and out the story. Of, out of curiosity, uh, if you look at that now, looking back over time, did it eventually come up or did it just keep going down? It took years, definitely yeah. took years. Uh, I think it was, now that I look back, three years after that uh, buying, did the stock start picking up? Mm. So it really took a while and it took a lot, it took more coverage, meaning a lot more analysts starting, started covering it from the zero or one that covered it before. It moved up to maybe about five or six. So usually, if I would talk about my, uh, you know, stocks in the Philippines not doing really well, a lot of the stories would be, you know, there was something wrong with the firm or there was something that was not disclosed. But for this particular uh, instance, you know, the stock was actually pretty, was, was actually good. It was just about maybe buying it at the right time and knowing when to go all in. Mm. All right. <clears throat> so let me uh, summarize what I took away from this story. There's a, a few things I was writing down. Um, one point that's an interesting point, and I'm sure you practice it in most of your, um, you know, most of the time, it's just that, you know, it's emotion that gets you excited, uh, is building a position slowly over time. And the benefit of that is that sometimes the research that we do on things is different when we own it. And we just own a little bit then whether we don't own it at all and we get all excited about it or we own a lot of it, then we become biased. <clears throat> but when you say, ah, let's just take a, a 1%, you know, let's, let's put 1% of our portfolio into that for right now and see what happens. It just, it's, it's one risk management tool uh, that has to do with what I would call you know, um, managing risk. The second thing, and I think that it's ultimately it's emotion that, that causes you to break that rule because you get excited about, this is a good story, we all like it. There's so many good things lined up. You know, we wanna get in now before this thing flies. So it's that, you know, that emotion. So that's my first uh, takeaway. The second one is the idea of a stop loss. And in, in my career as a sell side analyst, always talking to fund managers, you would never talk to somebody about a stop loss. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm doing all this research to find a fundamentally strong company. Why would I ever sell it if it went down? But one of the things is I've gotten older and in my own investing, I basically have come to the conclusion that sometimes you, you, you got the right stock, you got the right story, you just bought it at the wrong time. And a stop loss can sometimes force. Now, in, in the case of a fund management company that has a long-term objective and all that, it's a little bit hard to implement a stop loss. But you could say that we implement a stop loss that we sell 10% of our position if it goes down by more than you know, 15% of what we purchased it at on a rolling basis, let's say, or, you know, we'll, we'll look at it on a three month basis and say, where is the price relative you know, to where we bought it? Uh, so that's the, the second thing is, you know, stop loss does have some value and you can use it in a limited way. And then the third thing is liquidity risk. And that is, you know, when a stock is small and illiquid and there's not many people covering it, you may think that it's a great story. In fact, I'm just working on some research for a client of mine was just about to submit a very, very illiquid company to him. Now he has a 10 year time horizon and he's investing for a family office. So he doesn't mind the illiquidity, but when you're talking about someone that really needs that liquidity, then liquidity is a major risk factor. So those are three things I took away. Anything that you'd add? Oh, I totally agree. It's, it's about 
stop losses, that's one thing, or in my terminology, management action triggers goes beyond a certain point, you probably want to say, oops, maybe this value, uh, this, this value play is actually a value trap. I think that's one thing that I'd like to say. Um, I think at the bottom line, you're right. You, we have as fund managers, you have to understand that this position and selling that position does not represent a failure. You have to be able to separate yourself and your actions to be able to move accordingly. Because if you fall in love with your position, then you fall into the trap of throwing in bad, uh, good money after bad and making a problem even worse than it is. So this is a, <clears throat> a great lesson for the listeners. And, you know, Robert is obviously a highly experienced person in this area. And what you can hear from him is his, his willingness to accept that, hey, this didn't work out the way that we thought. We've made it, you know, we, we need to rethink this and then we need to exit that position. And I want to challenge all of the listeners. One way to do this is to think about the concept of zero-based thinking. And the idea is that, you know, start today. And, you know, imagine that you're a fund manager or you're, you're managing a team of fund managers or you're just managing your own portfolio. And if I had a team of fund managers, I'd bring them all into the room today and I'd go, oh, good news. And they'd say, what? Last night I sold all of your positions. Every one of you is holding 100% cash. Now what do you want to do with your money? And this concept of zero-based thinking to imagine that you do not own it now, would you buy it now, is one of the best ways to try to strip yourself from the emotional attachment, like, like Robert has said, falling in love with our investments. So, you know, very important lesson for all of us. All right, so based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering this exact same situation the next time it comes up? Well, I still think that people should look at the numbers. That will never change. Look at management. That's also very important. Look at size. Look at liquidity, um, which is important in markets such as ours, wherein you know, there's um, not much liquidity, especially for some stocks. Look also at the number of people who's co uh, who are covering that particular stock because it's also an indicator how much of pe how much people are buying into it or selling it. Um, but I think probably the most important is being able to act fast and being able to admit, you know, I made a mistake. Uh, I need to protect my clients. Move quickly. Um, I think that's one lesson that I learned. And maybe the, my final lesson is what's worked so well for you for the past years. You know, the thing that made you a star may not work in the next few years. So be ready to adapt, be ready to change um, how you manage, uh, not only from a fund management standpoint, also from a people management standpoint. Great, great lessons. In fact, one of the things I look at is stop loss. I test stop losses around Asia in different markets because I realize Different markets have different characteristics. And stop loss worked in every market for many, many years, except the Philippines. It was a market that just kept going up and stop loss would have just lost you money. But, you know, things change. And so, you know, keep, keep thinking about what you're doing. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Number one goal? Well, grow the, fir um, grow the business of uh, the asset management firm where I work for right now. Uh, that's our CBC. Um, have top, uh, top performing funds, and serve the needs of my clients. Beautiful. All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember to go to my worstinvestmentever.com to claim your discount on the course that excites you the most. As we conclude, Robert, I want to thank you for coming on the show. We've been trying to get this to work since I remember asking you about it when I was there in the Philippines uh, during your last charter recognition about a year or so ago. So I'm glad to have you on the show and on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Well, keep learning. I think that's, uh, that's one thing I can share with you. Keep evolving. Um, the world is evolving, and if you don't, you die. And you are a shining example of that through all of your education and the work that you do. I know 
through CFA as I was president of CFA Society here. And it's been a, a pleasure to watch you and your predecessors who have been fantastic with CFA Society in the Philippines. So congratulations. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, saying, I'll see you on the upside.